Welcome to Sound of the Yellow Horn, where faith, tradition, and philosophy meet the modern world. Here is your host, Mark Greer. Welcome to the show, everyone, and hail the gods and goddesses. I'm your host, Mark Pereer, and here we are on another episode of Sound of the Gjallarhorn. Now, today we're going to be talking about one of the most central institutions of our religion, and that is the Gothord, or priesthood, the Gothis and Gidyas, um, the people who sort of bring us all together, the ones who help organize, the ones who lead kindreds or hearth or clans or or whatever um, you know your organization represents, uh, the Gothord is sort of the the people who help bring it all together. And you know we're going to talk about the um, the ancient roles and and some of the the sources, and we're going to look into the training of them and the the the, the way that they can be manifested today. And you know looking at modern applications and stuff like that. So it's um. You know, it's it's an important role to take on. It it requires a lot of responsibility, a lot of um, a lot of duty is uh, centered around it. Um, in the ancient times, the, they were priest chieftains, so they weren't just people who, you know, you look at like priests and you look at, um, you know, like the Catholic priesthood or whatever, where they, um, you know, they basically devote their life to just the religion. I mean, they're they're also community leaders. They're also community organizers. And they're also the ones who, um, you know, helped advise people and help to, to bring people together. And, and, and sometimes, you know, they led the thing and they, they led the, the judiciary committee and stuff like that to try to, you know, um, arbitrate and, and, you know, swear oaths. And, you know, their, their insignia with the oath ring that they put on their arm, you know, that was a part of also the thing setting. So there's a lot of, a lot of, um, uh, duty that comes with a lot of responsibility. So, and, and we're going to have to look at that today. I mean, we're going to, we're, I believe strongly that we're going to need in order to move forward, we're going to need to start formalizing and, you know, adding these responsibilities to the God or that we need to expand the role and expand the duties to be what it is outside of just a ceremonial setting. Now, we do know that, um, you know, like as, as in Tacitus, the, uh, the Gaudis and Gidias, they performed pl- public rites and public divination. They, you know, did rune readings and stuff like that. Um, they were leaders and advisors, um, advice, giving advice. What was called Rada was, um, an important, you know, role to take on. I mean, it, it was an, an important duty that one must accept because you have to, you know, you're giving people advice, you're helping them to guide their life and make the right decisions. And, and people need that. I mean, and, and we look at that today and, you know, we see people more than ever need, you know, we have so many decisions to make and, it, and it's always good to have those um, advisors that can help us to make those decisions properly and help us to make the right ones so that we don't, you know, take our family or our community into a direction that could lead us towards the disaster. Um, we also know from the ancient sources, you had the role, it's called Hafgadi. Um, that's the temple priest or Hafgidya, the temple priestess. And these were the people who would upkeep the temple, take care of it, make sure everything was in order, uh, take the temple fees in order to maintain it. Um, you know, the, the Hof was, uh, the, you know, the central, um, sort of pillar of the faith and, and, and it is in every religion. I mean, the, you know, I, I think of like the Shintos or the Hindus and how like their temples, um, you know, sort of represent the, the center of the universe, it's sort of like their own heaven on earth, you know, and that's, that would be the same for us. Um, uh, and a big part of the role of the priests is as a medium. Now, the word Gaudi and Gidya means basically the godly ones. Um, some people mispronounce the word as Godi, but it's actually Gaudi, and it comes from the same word as God. It's the ones connected to the gods. The, the Gothard um, are the, uh, the ones, you know, who are mediums to the gods and goddesses, the ones who, who help to sort of make that spiritual connection, not in a sense of like a hierarchy like the Catholics have or whatever, but uh, in the sense that they're the ones that sort of act as that vessel that, you know, that dedicate their lives to studying the lore and understanding a connection to the gods and helping to share that connection with others so that when they perform a bloat, they perform a rite of passage, you know, that they, they sort of have that, that central focus so that they can, you know, bring about the ceremony. And, and, and there's a lot of, um, important, uh, 
aspects of the ceremony that Agathe needs to be trained in so that they can make this the experience as profound as possible. And that's what it is. I mean, per, the performance of ritual, the performance of ceremony is like a performance art and you have to train in it. You have to get good at it. Okay? You're not just reading, you know, words off of a page. You have to know how to bring the people together and how to, um, to have that experience. And I've, I've seen some people who are, who are pretty good at it, you know, and I've seen some people who are excellent at it, who people, people who literally, you know, their experience brings people to tears. And, um, you know, when they perform the symbol and, and they can feel the solemnity and they feel the connection and, and that's power. I mean, that's, that's, that, that's the power of the faith. And that's the power of, of the connection of the community. And that power flows through the Gadi and Gidia who's there to, to sort of lead and direct everything to make that connection strong and make us, you know, connect to the gods in a way that, um, that is something that we walk away from when we remember, you know, something that, that, that impacts us. So, you know, this is, it's so much more than just public ceremony. Um, there's a lot, to this and there's a lot to the role a lot to the position and i think that the more we formalize the position the more we um we you know put training into it the more we you know sort of solidify the recognition of it as um a status within our faith community then that that's something that we can look to as a way that not only not only legitimizes our faith but it also you know connects us to the ancestors connects us to the gods connects us to the way of our people you know and we can look to the people who do this you know and um so you know we have the roles of the gathar the roles that they have where you know the performance of bloat the performance of public rune readings the leadership the advisory and stuff like that uh, a big one is the performance of rites of passage you know and that's that's a a, a big deal um, to me. It's uh, you know one of the bigger deals because it's like the bloats represent the yearly cycle, whereas the rites of passage represent the lifetime cycle. And these are events that you're only typically going to only perform once in your life for yourself. You know, um, you're going to be named once. You're going to ha- go into adulthood once. You're going to get married once. You're going to get you know take your land. You probably you might do that a few times nowadays, but in ancient times you were building an estate, so it was typically considered once and you're going to die once, you know? And so that's, that's the, the, the cycle. And so when a God or Gidea performs the ceremony, I mean, that's something that they have to really be really versed in and really good at, you know? Um, I, I think of like, if, if, and this is something I've never had the privilege of doing, um, is performing a funeral, you know, what you have to think if you're going to take on the role of God or Gidea, you know, where, where are you going to, um, stand when you when it comes time to do this because you're not going to just be there with odinus and ossetruer like you do at a bloat i mean you're going to be there with family and it's going to be family from all kinds of faiths and all kinds of paths and you know you have to get in there and you have to make sure that when you perform this right that it's something that you know is is like the the greatest honor that you can give this person in a way that's respectful to everyone and respectful to our faith and respectful to the faith of the deceased and, and you, you have to be able to perform that well and do that right. So, you know, that's when training comes in. That's when, you know, uh, an understanding of how to do this comes in and, and, and that's why it's necessary. So, um, you know, you're going to have people also, you know, looking at you when they have marital problems, when they have personal problems, when they have issues with their, um, with their kids or whatever, and they're going to need advice and they're not only going to need advice um, you know, in a way that, um, you can help them to guide them through the problem, but they're also going to need to trust you. You know, um, I actually believe that one of the, the better aspects of sort of the, the Catholic priesthood and stuff like that is the, um, the whole idea that what's, what's spoken in the confessional is, is what is stays there. You know, you're not going to get that out of them. And, uh, and that's something we should do. I mean, if we should, ha- we should build a layer of trust with people that lets them know, you know, when you come to me and you ask advice and it could be something, you know, as long as it's nothing, you know, really criminal or bad, like you're hurting kids or anything, you know, as long as it's nothing like that, I mean, we, uh, you should be able to confide in me and know that I'm not going to go run around telling everybody and, and break that trust, you know? So there has to be a, a level of honor and a level of, of trust with that. That's higher than anything. Because people are going to come to you with their, you know, their deepest thoughts and secrets and need to get that off their chest. And and you need to be able to be there and speak with them. Um, And, you know, sometimes you're going to have to um, adjudicate disputes. You're going to have to 
help people to um, if like they feel like they have violated sort of our religious laws or whatever, then, you know, you're going to have to be able to help them to uh, sort of appease themselves with the, the community and with the gods and and all that. You're going to need to, um, you know, if they're going to need lore interpreted to to help them, because I, I've always believed that when you look at the lore in the in its proper sense, um, the lore is almost like looking at a lot of case law, which is why Loki plays such a central role in the lore, because he's basically showing people like this is what happens when you mess up. This is what happens when you cause problems. You know, you can still um, be a part of the community as long as you don't take these steps and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and Loki just shows how far it goes, how far it can, it, it's taken and what's, what steps can be done. You see, like every time Loki messes up, he always has to make up for it. That's, that's our law. That's Avrad Gyalda. That's Gam, uh, Gambin Gildan. It's, you know, the payment of compensation, the, the, trying to make up for your mistakes rather than just simply asking for forgiveness or whatever, you know, you have to, to make up for your mistakes and your, and your, the problems that you've caused and that's that's seen throughout our entire lore all the way through even the gods have done it you know um when they killed Goveg, uh the you know there was a payment of compensation a, a making a righting of wrongs and as a gothi i mean it, the thing is is like when you look at other priesthood they've got it pretty simple as far as christianity goes because they just say well just say 10 hail marys and and ask jesus for forgiveness and blah blah blah, blah. and um you know and then uh you know, it's, it's just like that. But for us, I mean, for our gathered, you're going to have to, you know, try to help people to figure out ways to, to make things right, you know, and you're gonna have to apply it to the specific situation that they're in and help them to get, get, to get through it so they can right the wrongs that they've committed. So, um, you know, uh, then after that, you know, you're going to have to be basically a pillar of your community. You're, you are the one as the Gothi or Gidea, who is the one who has to rep maintain the reputation of your community, of your clan, your hearth or kindred. Um, so you have to be sort of that pillar. You have to be the one that, you know, has, you know, understands the law and understands the lore and understands the, um, the rights and, and their significance and the symbolism behind them. So you can explain it to people so you can represent our faith. Well, so you know how to articulate, what it is that we are to outsiders so that, you know, so there's not misunderstanding. And I mean, it's, it's a very important role. It's a very important position and, and it needs to be taken very seriously. Um, you know, and, and that goes with, you know, in today's age, that goes with social media and stuff like that. You have to be careful. I mean, I, I myself have been guilty of, of making mistakes and, and I, you know, tr I'm trying, going to try to do better and try to make sure that I watch myself because I do know that I have to, I have to represent our faith. I have to represent our community. And that's something that I take very seriously. I, I, and I want to be able to do that in a way that, you know, people see us as a religion as something that could be respected and, and something that is seen as legitimate and, and honorable, you know? So the thing is, is, um, we have, uh, after that, you know, we start looking into how do we train the Gothard? How do we um, start to um, perform some sort of formal training, something that would allow people to take on these roles, not just in a sense of learning how to perform rites, learning how to perform, you know, public ceremony and stuff like that, but also, you know, to take on those roles as advisors, to take on the roles of leadership, to take on the roles that, you know, that people need. I mean, because at the end of the day, I mean, when someone comes to you and says, you know, look, um, Let's, let's just take a, a, a very extreme example, okay? Someone in your kindred, someone in your community comes to you and says, hey, you know, I've, I've been really depressed lately and I've been thinking about committing suicide. So what do you do there? You know, how do you answer that? How do you answer, your, answer that question? What do you do for them? Well, you, you're going to need to know. You're going to need to know these things so that you can be there for them. And because that's, that's what, you know, we're going to talk about in a minute we're doing is, is we're breaking away from the need for these so-called experts who want to treat you like a lab rat and analyze your brain and try to, you know, use all these textbook answers and stuff like that, because that's, that's, we're, we're trying to move away from that so that there's more of a community answer, a more of a community standard so that we come together and help each other out. We don't have to go to experts in the fields, which we feel is part of the breakdown of our communities and our, and our families and our society. I mean, we don't need those people. And in ancient times, you had the leaders of the clans and you had the leaders of the tribes and they're the ones who, uh, who did these things, performed these roles. You don't need psychiatrists and counselors and psychologists and all that stuff when you have spiritual leaders. 
Now, there may, may come times when, when such things are necessary, like when you're looking at people with, you know, severe schizophrenia or autism or other mental illnesses and stuff like that, that you just can't take on that. I mean, and I, and I wouldn't tell anyone to do so. But when it's just counseling, when it's, you know, talking about problems, when it's helping couples stay together, when it's all those different, you know, just run of the mill, normal things that spiritual leaders have always done for centuries and centuries, then, you know, this is something that, um, that we should take on that we don't need those people for. And we need to tell the people that we don't need them for. Um, you know, so when we, when we look at formal training, I mean, we, we can look at other religions, like consider the Brahmins who, you know, from an early, an early point in their training, they have to start memorizing the entire Rig Veda, which is about as big as the phone book. I mean, it's a huge book and they have to memorize every single word of it to, in order to become a Brahmin. Now, I don't, I'm not saying that we should do that, but I think that, you know, we can look at, at it as a, a practical, uh, form of training where we can, you know, take the roles that need to be done, the things that need to happen and the, the, and, and try to make them make that person as effective in those roles as possible. Um, so when you have, you know, not just the performance of bloats and prayers and rites of passage, I mean, cause you're going to need to be trained in those. You need to, you know, to, to understand sacred verse, you need to understand what, what all the symbolism means. So if anyone asks, you can tell them it's, you need to, um, help people, you know, with the rites of passage. You, I mean, these are things that, that require a lot of training in and of themselves, but then there goes, you know, beyond that, there's the social aspect that has to be expanded upon as well. Um, and then once you have, that, um, that training, once you've gone through it and, and the Norse societies, you know, we're, we're working on eventually, uh, establishing, um, a course for all, all of the positions within our community. Um, the Gadi and Gidea being one of the foremost, um, you know, and, and we're just looking for the right medium. We're looking for all the right, you know, uh, things I have a lot of the stuff written up, but we just have to make sure that what we do is going to be easily accept accessible while at the same time being something, uh, a format that is, um, easily easy to use and something that a lot of people will be able to, you know, get to and, and, and learn from. Um, but once that formal recognition happens, right, then there needs to be some way for that person to represent that recognition. And I, I believe strongly in vestments and oath rings, um, or vestments, you know, being a, a garb. I mean, it doesn't, I don't think that it necessarily needs to be something archaic looking. I think we can go for a more modern look in it, but as long as it's something that when you see it, you know, this person is a God, you know, when you see the person wearing this, you know, that person is a representative of this faith because it needs to stand out. It needs to stand out as something that people can see in a modern context and know this person represents this. And that way that if there's any questions or anything that needs to be done, you know, that this, this person can be looked to and, you know, not just a, 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 a jacket or whatever, a, a some sort of long coat or something like that. Um, you know, you also, the, the one that we have the records of that we know, you know, um, are the oath rings. Now I would say this, and I, and I'm, this is something that we've worked on and something we're going to, um, eventually try to utilize once we do have our Gothi course. But I believe strongly that vestments, it's not necessarily a, the style of it because our ancestors were actually kind of like a lot of people today where we have different styles. We have different, um, you know, fashions and things change. And, and there actually are records that that happened it, it, within the ancient priesthood, that there, there were different styles of dress and clothing and, and stuff like that. And, and they would change with time and they didn't mind changing it. And, um, but I actually, the reason why I think that is, is because I believe that it was the type of material used that was more important than the way it looked. Right. Because throughout the lore, we see that linen, which is made from flax, um, that linen is, um, the most important cloth and it's mentioned in a lot of sources. It's mentioned in like sacred charms. It's mentioned in, you know, ancient clothing. It's, it's, it, there's a lot of time that lin linen is, um, is mentioned in the lore and in the sources. And, and so it's, it's a big deal. And I think that that is, is the center most, um, idea behind it that, you know, we, we could design something that's formal. Uh, formalize something that's sort of uh, recognizable and something that we can all, you know, sort of see and know that that's the Gavi's coat or whatever. Um, but the, the, as far as it being sacred, I think that making it out of linen is probably the central 
uh, tradition behind it, at least. I'm not saying that you have to do it that way, but that, that's what I would advise. And then, of course, you have the oath rings, which are, um, like, that is the only thing we have mentioned of the Gothis and Gidias that, um, that they did wear an oath ring on their arm. And I believe strongly that this oath ring was uh, in the form of a serpent, and that serpent represented a, um, a you know, the serpents in, in Niflhel that, you know, punished oath breakers and stuff like that. And it was sort of a reminder to keep your oath and not to break it and stuff like that. So when we have that, um, you know, that oath ring on the arm, I mean, you, you, you know, you're talking to a God. And if you have it in a specific theme, in a specific way, and I've, you know, I'm, like I said, we're talking to people right now. In order to get these built in a, in a very unique way so that you know this is the Gothi ring. Not just something you can buy at a Renaissance fair that has a serpent motif. But an actual ring that shows that this is the Gothi ring. And this is something that is sacred and important to the people who, um, who wear it. Right? So once you have the vestments and you have the oath ring and stuff like that. Then you know that you're, you're looking at an ordained Gothi or Gidya. And... And this is a, a, the, a person that you can go to. Um, it, it, you know, it, we're going to go towards the membership side now. I mean, not, and, you know, the roles that they take on. If, if I have an issue and if I have a problem, if I need help, then I can go to a spirit, spiritual counseling. I mean, and I've, I've actually had doctors come to me and, and ask me in the past, you know, like you need to speak to a spiritual counselor on this. You need to speak on this about this issue. I mean, it was really, you know, heavy stuff that was happening. So, um, you know, we need that. And at the time we really didn't have it. We didn't know what to do. So the, um, the thing is, is that we have to have this role within our community. We have to have it so that people can have someone to go to so that when they have these, these really hard hitting decisions, they can call them on the phone or, 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 you know, go see them and say, Hey man, I really need your help. I really need you to help me in this situation. And, you know, and I, and I want to, 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 to do that for people. I want to help people. And, and I hope that other people who aspire to be Gaudis and Gidias, that they, that they also want to do that, you know, that they're not just out to just put a roll, a sticker on themselves and say, look at my badge. I'm so awesome. I'm a Gaudi. You know, I've read all these books and I know this language and blah, 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 which to me is nothing. Like I'm, I'm telling you right now, I don't think that's anything. You know, what's, what matters is the services you perform for your community, the help that you can give people, the charity that you perform for them, the things that you do to reach out and make sure that they're okay in their life and that they're making decisions that are helpful and good for them. And so then we, you know, once we look at that, we're looking at modern applications, the modern applications of all of this, you know, um, and I think that the biggest thing for us, like I said before, is, is defeating the experts. You know, a lot of people think that every time we have a problem, we got to call on the phone or Google somebody who's an expert in the field and that these people are the greatest people who walk the earth and they know everything about everything. And we should just go listen to them and what they have to say. Now, that's not always a bad thing. I mean, I know if, like if I need a, a plumber and I, you know, there's something I can't do. It's like some inner working piping stuff that I can't get into then I'll probably call a plumber and say, Hey, you know, how do we do, what can we do here? Um, and it's, you know, and, and there's a lot of times that that happens. And, and like I said, if, if there's someone with severe mental illnesses and stuff like that, then that, you know, that person needs to go see a psychiatrist who's trained and, and can help them with their medication and, and get all that balanced out and stuff like that. But, and, you know, that's something that a Gavi or Gidea, um, unless they actually have that training, um, aren't going to be able to do. And in some cases it would be illegal to do. So, you know, we need to, uh, to always make sure we use common sense in these situations. And so, but the thing is, is that when it comes to just seeking advice, when it comes to, Hey, I have a problem and I need help with it. You know, th we need the Gadi and Gideon needs to be there for them and, and help them and, and, and show them the way that, you know, they can make a decision on it and, and not just tell them what to do, but actually help them to, to sort of flesh it out and, and find their own way to making it right or to, um, you know, to find peace with it. And, you know, we live in this world where everything is a subscription. We have to subscribe to everything and everything comes with, you know, all sorts of questionnaires and what did, did you like this? Did you like that? And they're always seeking data and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, we're trying to return to something that we know, we believe in our hearts that our ancestors got a lot out of because they did it for thousands of years. 
And so that's why people are attracted to our religion. That's why people look to it and say, hey, you know, our ancestors were doing this for a long time, you know, and they, they really got a lot out of it. So what can I get out of it? What can, you know, how this, can this help my family? How can this help those around me that I love? And as a Gadir Gideon, you're the one that has to be there and answer that question. You're the one that has to be there and say, this is what you get out of it. And what you get out of it is what the Gadir and Gideon gives to you and helps you with and is there to serve you and help to, to be there for you, you know, and that's, that's what the role is. You know, they, they say that they were chieftains and advisors. I mean, that's what the role is. It's not just playing dress up and, and performing ceremonies. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's about trying to, you know, get out there and, and be a, an important member of your community, a pillar of your community so that you can step up and stand up and be this, you know, representative of the full community. And so that they have that person to look to. And this goes into everything we've always talked about for years about building communities, about building areas and enclaves and, and building the things that we need, you know, and that all is going to start with central figures that can help organize things and get things going. And, you know, that, that certainly does not mean that we're like demeaning other people or saying that Gothis or Gideos are higher or better than them or whatever. We're just saying that this is the role that has the most responsibility because it's the leadership role of the kindred, hearth, clan, tribe, whatever. And so it, it, this is the one where the most amount of work is going to be put into it. And the most amount of training is going to be put into it because it's, it's, you know, one of the hardest positions within our community. But there are going to be people who are going to want to step up and do it and be a part of it and connect to it. So, you know, this is um, it's a it's a big deal. And it's something that I think that, you know, we all need to come together and, and start creating sort of these standards for our entire faith community. And we say, hey, you know, these are the things that we agree on on this. These are the things that we believe will work. And these are the things that we can as, you know, different organizations and stuff like that can come together on. And, you know, the North Society is going to, we're working our hardest to try to make sure that we have these, you know, um, classes and, and different traditions that we're going to build and, and develop and using ancient sources and, and using everything that we can so that we can, you know, continue to legitimize our faith and normalize our faith and, and give it sort of a, um, a path towards the future, you know. Um, so we can move past a lot of the introductory stuff that we've done, which has been great, but we think that, you know, it's time to start taking further steps and further steps. And, you know, obviously there's been a lot of great work done as far as Gothis and Gideas and, and training and stuff like that. But, you know, the Norton Society, we're always trying to look towards the next horizon. We're always trying to look towards, you know, doing the next work for it. So with that, uh, that's all our, all we got to this week or this month on the sound of the Galahorn on that. Um, if you have any comments or questions, you know, just, uh, you can, we're on Facebook or, uh, you can look at our website, www.norna.org or email us, uh, Norna society at gmail.com. Um, you can uh, email me mark.norna at gmail.com. Um, we have lots of stuff on our website, books and essays. I just put up uh, the send a book, which is our book on rights and prayers and stuff like that. So any questions, anything you need, just, uh, you know, let me know. And, uh, we're always happy to help people and happy to help continue this faith moving forward. And with that, I want everybody to have a good night. With brick and stone, with